thank, thank, thank you so much. Uh, I need hardly say what a great pleasure it gives me to be in Rio again. Um, unfortunately, in the interval since my last visit in 1998, my Portuguese has advanced not at all. <laughs> and I'm afraid I must uh, address you in another language. Um, in fact, what brings me to Brazil is a promise that I made to colleagues here that uh, when I retired, I would visit again. And I'm very newly retired, and, uh, and, and, and here, here I am. But I also appreciate the opportunity to be with you and share some recent work. Uh, many of you know how much I admire the work that you people do here. What I'm going to talk about came from two requests. And uh, I have to say that I'm always happiest writing because somebody has asked me to do this or that. That is, set me a topic, set me a task. Even if, as in the case that you're about to hear, uh, what I was asked uh, went somewhat against, against the grain and deployed a vocabulary that I wouldn't have deployed myself. But nonetheless, the challenge is always to make something interesting about a, a, from the other person's request. And I find that actually much easier than an open-ended invitation to simply speak about what one would like. Of course, so this, the, the paper I'm, to, I'm going to give you is in response to two requests, as you'll hear in a moment. But of course, at each iteration, each reputation, uh, re repetition of the paper, uh, that one discusses, one comes across holes and errors and lacunae that one didn't see before, um, or else are very kindly pointed out to one by the particular audiences one encounters. Uh, and in fact, in the present paper, quite late in the day, I came to a particular formula uh, that I shall hold on to in this presentation, but I'm not quite sure that it holds steady throughout the paper. So I'm greatly looking forward, in fact, to your comments. So this is written in uh, response to a request that overlies another request. My response to being asked by a Center for Melanesian Studies in, at the University of Garoka in Papua New Guinea to talk about contemporary Melanesia became the substance of a second response to being asked to talk about the anthropologists modern field, that being to a postgraduate research seminar in Denmark. And what I'm giving you is a slightly modified version of that second response. Now the rubric under which I was asked to talk about the modern field uh, contained the following comment. The modern field includes not only other places, but also other kinds of places. If the modern field includes not only other places, but also other kinds of places, then it must also include other kinds of people. I begin with some people who share the anthropologist's dilemma of where to locate a modern field. These are people who, like the anthropologist, want to be up to date and to be seen to have an outlook that is thoroughly contemporary yet in finding themselves reluctant to ignore former times and former anthropologies, also find a contrast between new and old knowledge. The contrast presents itself simultaneously as though there were a choice to be made and as though the construction of old and new in knowledge making was simply an outcome of the passing of time. And this forking, this two paths, I take as diagnostic of a modernist ethos. The people I'm talking about can be forgiven for eliding tradition and modernity with the old and the new because the contrast is for them overdetermined by another axis created by their colonization and their liberation from it. The people I have in mind live, and of course you know where they live, live in Papua New Guinea where there is a general concern laid down, in fact, in the colonial era with what it means to be modern, to follow new ways, and by the same token, what alternatives there might be. 
but it's one articulated especially closely to the anthropologist dilemma by the scholars who set up the Center for Melanesian Studies at the University of Garoka. Their backgrounds are in anthropology, sociology, history, literature, general studies. They aren't alone, of course, but I mentioned the Garoka Center since I was there earlier this year. And I was invited by the academics at Garoka to speak on contemporary Melanesia. As I said to them, it might seem odd for someone as I was then on the verge of retirement to talk about the contemporary. But that was in fact almost a paradigm for what I wanted to say about the future of Melanesian studies. Because if you think about it, by this stage, I've lived through many of what I would call contemporary moments. In fact, I have a great accumulation of situations in which I've been contemporary. Now, all I mean by that phrase was being aware of the time frame one is in. That time frame is always the present, can't be anywhere else, but the awareness is of different pasts, long or short, of which it's composed. Now, the invitation from Garoka came with a specific suggestion that I address, and I'm quoting, the relationship between indigenous-centered and Eurocentric knowledge and how inevitable the move is from one to the other. The concern of these Papua New Guinean scholars, and you'll, and you'll notice the, the, the implied alternation in that phrase. I'll read it again. The relationship between indigenous-centered and Eurocentric knowledge and how inevitable the move is from one to the other. The concern of these Papua New Guinean scholars lay in the implicit prognosis that what they called indigenous-centered knowledge had no chance against knowledge practices with a Eurocentric origin. And you have to realize what a commitment these people are making to devote themselves to academic and museum-related work on Melanesian societies and cultures when their brothers and cousins go for medicine or law or business or administration studies or whatever. Now this paper comes with an invitation to the to the listener, to yourselves, um, to yourselves imagined as a group of academics. I mean, you're other things as well, but I'm imagining you now as a group of academics. And I invite you to think of yourselves momentarily alongside the academics from this emergent university. Groka was a former teacher training college in the Eastern Highlands of Papua New Guinea. Now what follows isn't quite the lecture I gave there, but I give you the gist of it. Retelling it now with the Garoka academics in mind is perhaps one way of inhabiting the contemporary. And this, of course, is what I was also saying to the Danish audience. So you can add the Danish. I don't know which side of you, right or left, you've put the Papua New Guinean audience, but to the other side, you can put the Danish audience. Uh, a, a conference of uh, Danish uh, graduate students, I think the Danish equivalent of ANPOX, except that it's n nothing to do, it's, it's only to do with um, uh, anthropology. And, and as I said to the Danish audience, its subject matter was also very germane to the debate on the modern field. So now in addressing you, um, I've put you alongside the other two audiences. Now the question I was asked by the Grokans gave me my terms of reference, indigenous-centered and Eurocentric knowledge. Although I would never have phrased things quite like that myself, nor indeed would I ever have drawn that up as a contrast. Categorical contrasts in any case are not fashionable these days in anthropology, but here I was being requested to deploy one. Indeed, I felt bound to deal with the two categories as salient in these peoples, that is the Grokan academics, imagination of their scholarly enterprise. And my evocation of time frames was a way of handling the fact that I was dealing with these categories that I wouldn't myself have um, presented in that way at all. So what I did, I asked in turn that they suspend any axiomatic asso association between modernity and Eurocentrism and the contemporary. Instead, speaking from the present, I took Eurocentric and indigenous knowledge as existing within the same time frame 
And my examples came from a real-life sequence of events in Papua New Guinea um, and also uh, beyond to some extent. And they captured an alternation between now privileging Eurocentric knowledge and now privileging indigenous-centered knowledge, either could, but, it, but it was an alternation that wasn't a perpetual bifurcation. On the contrary, either could be foreground or background in relation to the other. The exercise then encouraged me to a piece of exploration of my own. And I'd like to think that what I present to you, alongside the assembled University of Garoka and the Danish ANPOX, is an example of being in a modern field, at least so, insofar as it involves a choice. Uh, from my perspective, any choice of roads has to be a question of analytical framing. So where do we encounter Euro? Uh, centric or indigenous centric knowledge. Not just in what people say or profess to know, but as values and assumptions embedded in their practices and institutions. And by institutions, I do not just mean organizations such as companies or clans, but any organized or conventional way of doing things. My example comes from law, though by no means confined to lawyers, and from a debate over intellectual property rights. In fact, in relation to this topic, some of those from the Danish seminar were already alongside the Papua New Guinean academics. And I referred to, for example, uh, to one person's article on ownership of cultural practices in Manus in Papua New Guinea and another book, to another book on cultural creativity. So what is it that now gets foregrounded and now gets backgrounded? Now this is the point at which a PowerPoint presentation might have been useful. So I want you to imagine a sequence of four PowerPoint slides, if you would, please. Okay, slide one. Let's start, let's start with embedded Eurocentric knowledge. IPR is embedded in Eurocentric ways of thinking about the person and relations, and that is IPR, I'm sorry, intellectual property rights is embedded in Eurocentric ways of thinking about the person and relations and things as possessions. In the late 1990s, Papua New Guinea, like other Pacific Island states and several countries elsewhere, was put under pressure from international interests, and I can talk about those later if you'd like, to develop its own copyright and patent laws. As far as the latter was concerned, if, and again if you think about it, it was in the interests of technology exporting countries to be able to exercise their rights of ownership in technology importing countries. People couldn't just copy what they liked, although under license um, they could, from those who, they could uh, 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 acquire a license from those who owned the patent. Ideas are intangible, but what could be protected would be forms of expressing them or their embodiment in inventions. So here Eurocentric practices were foregrounded and Papua New Guinea legislation has followed a more or less the international format. Now while commerce was at the heart of the motive here, along with the legal forms came Eurocentric views of the person. Prime examples were the idea that inventions could be attributed to specific inventors or to the companies that funded them or indeed to the universities that funded them for that matter. And that works of art were the outcome of individual authorship these intangible products of the mind had a value. The corollary was that authorship implied ownership, that those with whom an idea originated had rights over any profit to come from that idea, a corollary that does, after all, make sense in a world where people subsist, that is, earn income by their inventions or products. Of course, the legislation doesn't just serve outside interests. Thus, copyright holds a potential within Papua New Guinea for the protection, uh, for instance, of today's writers or musicians or other people in the creative arts. Okay, that was slide one. Eurocentric practices were foregrounded. Slide two. What was arresting about the international pressure to legislate was a counterpart indigenous movement across several developing countries in the 1990s, early 2000s, including the Pacific Islands. Intellectual property was conceived to be an instrument that could be turned to the benefit of those who, for years, had not been able to articulate the value 
they put on their own intangibles in the form of knowledge or skills. Now suddenly it seemed there was an international language that recognized and literally put a price on what people reckoned to be of cultural value. And that, in fact, was already apparent at a seminar I attended in Port Moresby in 1997 and was followed through by two Papua New Guinean scholars, uh, Drs. Lawrence Kalinoe and Jacob Simet, uh, one an anthropologist and the other a lawyer, who conducted a cross-country survey on people's attitudes towards the protection of cultural property. Culture is, is an intangible, but what could be protected would be forms of cultural expression. Here we may say, it is indigenous-centered knowledge that is foregrounded. How could IPR, uh, intellectual property rights, be turned to the service of cultural property? Intellectual property rights regimes, in fact, stimulate a wider notion of cultural property than its former museum-based connotations implied. It embraces ideas, artifacts, medicinal knowledge, plant varieties, even genetic endowment. But what informed this move to thinking about cultural property were indigenous concepts of persons and the relations in which persons were embedded. So although these people were using the language of property, it was clear that in a Melanesian context, there was a widely articulated desire to recognize the relational rather than individual origins of cultural artifacts. Moreover, against ownership, an emphasis was put on the circulation of items of value through exchange. And this was all considerably heightened in a context where people were also learning to articulate their identity in terms of culture. However, it became clear that Eurocentrically informed intellectual property rights would not do the work that was now needed to be done. And the Pacific Islands, in fact, turned jointly to develop an instrument of their own, a legal instrument, that is, for the protection of expressions of culture that would take uh, relational interests into account. Uh, and in the language that these people are using, again, not, not my language, um, they would often elide uh, relational with collective, sometimes even communal. Okay, now this is a familiar story that many of you will have heard in other contexts, one that could be repeated for many innovations and developments. But it has some interest if it's seen as a thoroughly contemporary interweaving between Eurocentric and indigenous-centered knowledge. However, it's to be hoped that such contemporary moments could lead to another kind of scholarship, one rather more exploratory and experimental. So let me continue my story of foregrounding and backgrounding with this in mind. And we come to slide three. Suppose we turn again to foregrounding Eurocentric practices. Intellectual property rights might turn out to be largely irrelevant when it comes to protecting what people in Papua New Guinea regard as, regard as of value. But nevertheless, it may throw up concepts or approaches that have a longer shelf life. I'm thinking of the way that social anthropology is always on the lookout for new tools of description and analysis. In recent years, when intellectual property rights ceased to be the exclusive domain of lawyers and was talked about all over the place, a huge surge of interest fueled by developments in digital music and human genetics and biotechnological developments and so forth, anthropology has seized on it for the potential analytical questions it raises. In an interesting but thoroughly Eurocentric way, it draws attention to how we might think about the origins of creativity and applied to a Melanesian context has refreshed interest, for example, in the transmissions of song, dance, magical formulae, and performative and non-performative creations of all kinds as reported in the ethnographic literature. So what's, what's happening here? The anthropologist's intention is not to imagine making new legal objects out of these practices, but to look again at what we thought we knew with new eyes, to turn back to those old accounts with fresh respect, because one can ask yet more questions of them. And I have to say one of my own private agendas behind me, so to speak, 
is how to keep a hundred years of eth ethnographic reporting uh, theoretically and analytically alive. And if the result, so to speak, is to keep the ethnographic record young, perhaps it has the same effect on the way past practices are enacted or reenacted in the present. So while in Europe intellectual property rights have been around for 200 years, it is only at a certain contemporary moment that it, that it has pressed in on social science and the humanities. People are made aware of dimensions of, act, of their activities that they weren't aware of before. And it's only at a certain contemporary moment that it seems to offer resources for understanding materials derived from long ago, and that applies as much to Melanesia as elsewhere. In fact, in following an interest in these things, the anthropologist would be doing what, what um, uh, many of their colleagues have argued in Papua New Guinea, that the concept of custom in Papua New Guinea already does. Custom is a way of keeping ways of being thoroughly in the present. Okay, slide four, <clears throat> end of this short sequence. However, if there might be some mileage to the ideas that come with certain Eurocentric institutions, even if the institutions themselves won't work as originally conceived, can we reverse the positions again and talk about the influence of indigenous-centered knowledge and thus once more foreground it? What would it mean to put intellectual property rights into a Melanesian context? Could Melanesian thinking change how we think about intellectual property rights? It has already shown up some of its limits, but is it possible to go further? Well, I'm sure that many of you are already familiar with the way diverse international approaches to the protection of the commons through open source software and so forth find resonance, if not with specifically Melanesian practices, then with practices elsewhere beyond the global internationalist purview. And this isn't just the anthropologist's parallel. Some of those who've worked on the protection for and distribution of computer programs, for example, in opposition to mainstream intellectual property rights, have drawn inspiration from their understanding, not mine, from their understanding of giving and sharing in other cultures. Indeed, the idea of the gift, with pointed reference to the anthropology of Melanesia, has long circulated among scientists to describe the circulation of knowledge outside an ownership and IPR context, the scientists being concerned with the patents that they produce for their uh, for their uh, uh, employers and funders, but on the other hand, with their own reputation that they establish through scientific writings that circulates in a kind of uh, uh, exchange system. And please, all these terms are in quotation marks. Um, I would never, in an uncomplicated way, um, uh, use the gift in a comparative context like that. Um, so, as I said, they aren't always terribly well informed, but the inspiration is there, a contemporary moment. And one wonders what contribution present-day Melanesian thinking might or might not make to the rather generalized notions that these open source computer activists work with. Now this brief excursus gives me reason for something else. I said I would present an exploration of my own as an example of being in a modern field. What I've given you in those four slides are renditions of certain uh, current, uh, current uh, uh, arguments. It's not the substance of what we deal with or the places from which we draw materials that interest me. From my perspective, the choice of roads really does have to be a question of analytical framing. My choice is to here in this paper is to pursue the contemporary. That is, I was acting out for the Grokan audience what to me was implied in their, in, their, uh, uh, in their question. So on the one hand, there was a question of, of analytical choice, which responds to a, a modernist uh, uh, ethos. Um, but as you will see, um, uh, my, the analytical choice is to pursue the notion of the contemporary, which is not an either or uh, issue, but a both and issue. Okay, <clears throat> this is my, 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 little ex my, my own experiment. 
The subject matter is land. If I say I want to introduce another way of looking at land claims, it's not to claim authorship of the notion. Rather, it's important to acknowledge its origins in others, on the one hand in the work of anthropologist James Leach, and on the other hand the people of Wrighty Village in the Madang area, who made him see that land can be thought of as creative. And behind them, of course, many others I can't do justice to here. And nothing could be more important than land, as important to present-day Melanesians as to anyone at any time. How to describe and analyze the issues is less simply put. And the following offers some reflections that go back and forth between Eurocentric ideas about intellectual property and what else we know of Melanesian ideas. To think about land rights at once enlarges and diminishes our vision. It enlarges, for at its greatest extent, the idea of land evokes the earth, the commonality of our existence, what we share, whether we like it or not. It diminishes insofar as land seems a particular, a particular materiality, a specific kind of resource, just one among many aspects of people's lives, a source of income. I want to see if we can deal with both these dimensions at the same time. This might in turn serve as a partial analogy for some of the exercises in multidimensionality by which we think we know ourselves uh, to be in a modern field. Now something of that first dimension is found in the notion that, that the language of land ownership is too restrictive, or that the general English language of land ownership is restrictive. An Australian judge tried to convey how very other Aboriginal concepts were from those found in the Eurocentric law of property in just this vein. And he concluded a famous lands claim case with the remark that rather than thinking of land belonging to people, why don't you think of people belonging to the land? The people here were members of a particular Aboriginal clan, and this was the most succinct way in which he could summarize the totalizing effect that land had on their lives. Almost exactly the same formulation is reported for the Are, Are people of Malaita in the Solomon Islands, although very interestingly, it contrasts with another formulation as well. A paramount chief from Malaita, explaining the different rules of Melanesian land tenure, included the nature of personal links to the land, because that is what people's accomplishments have sprung from, and where, like their ancestors, they will be buried. In this sense, people do own the land. But the observation is accompanied by an extensive ex explanation of how, in another sense altogether, people don't an own the land at all, rather the land owns them. The land owns are are people, he declared. The land owns men and women, they're there to take care of it. Now, an enlarged sense of what is at stake these days can also be set against other kinds of personal interests, such as those of investors who acquire land as real estate, land for development, land to plant cash crops, and so forth. But let's look more closely at this second and apparently diminished sense of land. Planners, of course, have their own aspirations, including improvement and wealth creation. Their aspirations are for land as an exploitable resource, appropriated and in the Papua New Guinea context, it would be for tea plantations or copper mining, copper mining perhaps, or for market gardening or Arabica coffee, in any event bringing in revenue. And we know that in many places, Papua New Guinea residents are keen for improvement and may seek profit for themselves. Indeed, they may actively embrace development, as happens across the country, where forms of public entitlement enable clan groups to control land as a legal asset. The current concept of landowner in Papua New Guinea simultaneously evokes the past, appealing to the depths of people's ancestral association with specific territories, while also drawing on an international language that gives them negotiating purchase with overseas companies, a contemporary moment, so to speak. Equally notable within Papua New Guinea has been the long history of local efforts to seek some kind of recompense for environmental damage and loss of livelihood, and the Octedi copper, copper and gold mine 
um, is a case in point, which you may well have heard about for the extensive environmental damage that it has done. But demanding recompense merges with people's own aspirations for wealth. In the expectation of the mine closing down, the Octedi Mine Continuation Agreements incorporate all kinds of local development packages in return for consent to allow operations to continue in the short term. So it's not just a question of enlarged and diminished apprehensions of land, there are different aspirations for it. And most stark would seem to be the contrast between rights that come from land owning the people and those that come from people owning the land. On the one hand, land is perceived as an embracing source, not just of livelihood, but of life, and not just the life of individuals, but the life of society, or at its greatest extent, if you use that language, humanity. On the other hand, land is a resource that its owners can exploit, that becomes a source of wealth as well as sustenance, that can be made productive. How do we reconcile these? Um, and if we want to, and that could well, of course, be a political question of whether or not uh, we would wish to reconcile these viewpoints. Uh, I, would, I only ask the question because I suspect that the antithesis is more a Eurocentric one than an indigenous-centered one. Now, it's safe to generalize about the way people in Papua New Guinea are very interested in land as a resource that produces resources. This is what mobilizes their sense of entitlement and the claims pursued in litigation, and it dominates thinking about land rights. We might then look in detail at the kinds of produce that land yields to its wealth-creating potential, to the way this wealth enters into people's transactions with one another, in short, to the land's productivity. And what we shall find is instead of an interest in the products of land being set against a cosmological concern with land as a source of life, implying ancestral regeneration and custodial responsibilities, rather, just as the, Sol uh, ju just as the Solomon Islands chief indicated, the two go together. And we might ask how this can be. In the same way as the Australian judge had to make play with the notion of ownership we need to alter our understandings of productivity. Suppose we took another analytical route and talked instead of creativity and thought of the land as creative and its products as creations. Now, I should say at once that I intend nothing mystical here. I draw not on the language of religion nor alongside the writer of Madang, who was the, sort, the inspiration for James's, James Leach's account, uh, nor indeed the idiom of reproduction, but on the language of law. There's a whole class of law in the Eurocentric tradition, as I've already noted, devoted to the issues of creativity and people's creations, namely intellectual property rights. In the, te in the technical manner of lawyers, the legal definition of creativity becomes one that can be applied almost automatically, as in the supposition that the author of a work is the one who literally creates it. However, that's exactly the kind of automatic connotation I seek because the entitlements I'm talking about arise in a very straightforward way from people's demonstration of their connections to land. Indeed, they may think they need do no more than demonstrate a connection and entitlement is evident. Here, we can mobilize a contrast between two types of Eurocentric property law in order to find a vocabulary with which to, with which to make credible an indigenous or Melanesian contrast between rights to land regarded as a source of creativity, land owns people, and rights to its creations, people own land. And this is the European distinction between intangible and tangible property. For it may help us appreciate Melanesians' people's interest in the intangible dimension of land just as much as the tangible to think of their intangible connections as a kind of resource too, bringing its own entitlements by analogy with the Eurocentric idea of intellectual property. And you do realize that at least um, speaking in, in English, uh, a big leap of the imagination uh, is required since, and I think this is true in European jurisprudence in general, land is often held up in uh, modernist uh, contrast to intellectual property 
as the type example of something that is manifestly tangible. Um, and the legal uh, description of that, of course, um, is, is, is to say that, that, that land is real property in English. My purpose then is to ponder on how the intangible may be regarded as a resource, which is what intellectual property law is all about. The notion of an intangible resource points to what might be at stake in claims that are incomprehensible when land is understood simply as a material or tangible asset. Land in the situation I'm talking about, as I've tried to make evident, can be both at the same time. Now I speak from the perspective of the Western Highlands in Papua New Guinea is the area I know best. Here land flourishes not just by how it's cultivated, but because of its association with specific ancestors who've worked the area and who are thought to exert a, a, a benign influence most of the time. Land has on it the name of a particular group, clan or lineage, and the rights people have to enjoy the fruits of the land depend on entitlement through their links to the clan and its former members. And we could think of that name, perhaps, as a bit like a trademark, a term borrowed from intellectual property, at least insofar as it's a name to which exploits are attributed and reputation accrues. The clan name is simultaneously attached to the land and to those living there who walk around with its name upon them. Entitlement to use a particular name is, of course, restricted but everyone has such a name. Now trademarks are primarily, as the lawyers would say, things in action, rights that can only be enforced by legal action as opposed to, say, rights of possession. As indicated, they belong to that class of property, intellectual property, generally described as intangible. Of course, such property takes material form, but what is protected by the rights is the creative effort that brings the thing into existence. Thus, copyright law, to prevent others from taking advantage of one's creative activity, must apply to a material expression, say, a particular text, but it's the composition that is protected, not the printed page. Similarly, patent law can only be applied to artifacts, to things made, what is protected being the right of the inventor to prevent others from exploiting without permission the original combination of ideas and efforts that led to the invention. We can also think of people protecting the reputation and ancestry manifested in land. In the Western Highlands, land that yields the staple food sweet potato is also divided up into territories. These are the notional spaces of clan groups. Their boundaries are marked and defended. Of course, it's not the hedges and the ditches that people are protecting it's their notion of the integrity, reputation, and ancestry of the clan that resides there. So one might call a boundary a piece of intellectual property. While it's not protected by a legal system as such, it's certainly a thing in action, insofar as rights to establish a boundary can only be perpetuated through people defending or activating it, that is, by the clan acting in its full territorial extent. This echoes the need to keep up claims to possession. A clan member has to activate particular claims to particular gardens by gardening there or loses them. For what is at stake in both is the tangible concept of the clan. Land as territory is also a horticultural resource that nurtures people and everything that grows on it. But in either case, we could call the land productive. For territory produces too. That is, it produces people with a specific name and identity, and in this sense, the most tangible landscape, one that the clan can possess, can also become a notional and intangible counterpart to the living body of people. However, this is the moment at which to turn to the question of analytical choice and question the concept of productivity. What lies behind the Eurocentric notion of productivity? Now one could illustrate uh, the productive model from countless sources. Here is just one. And I choose it because it uses an analogy similar to that I've deployed in suggesting we compare land claims to intellectual property rights. Here intellectual property is being compared to land. <laughs> 
It belongs to early formulations in England <clears throat> at the time in the 18th century when a new notion was growing that authorial copyright could refer not just to the material but to the immaterial, not just to the book as a physical body but to a more abstract entity, the composition as a text. Now supporting the author's cause was an old equation between literary property and landed estates from which a living might be made. And this is an idiom that the lawyers borrowed from the printers and the booksellers. The booksellers had long argued that their copies, property that was at once the manuscript and the right to multiply copies of a particular title, were the equivalent of other people's landed estates, their farms. We see here elements too of those ideas of individual ownership to which I referred. While in the early modern period the most common metaphor employed to represent the author's relation to his writing is paternity, the author as begetter and the book as child, others included the author as singing shepherd, vessel of divine inspiration, and farmer, in language of the time, a tiller of the soil. In this metaphor, the image of land is being used to make the effort of intellectual work manifest in material and tangible products. So what it introduces is the notion of the produce to be gained from the land. With a sense of tilling and harvesting comes also, of course, the idea of labor and the idea that the justification for property rights lies in the person's investment of labor. In other words, people get produce from the land by dint of exertion applied to it. And the early proponents of intellectual property were claiming that mental work should bring entitlements Quite a, that mental work should bring entitlements quite as much as physical work. That early modern logic still lingers. It departs radically from the Melanesian ideas I'm dealing with. And in being suddenly aware that I'm being filmed, I'm also made aware about how immobile I am standing directly behind this, simply confronting uh, the camera without any singing and dancing on the side. In the indigenous-centered world, that's partly, of course, I'm trapped by the microphone, but never mind. In the indigenous-centered world of the Western Highlands, no such value is put on labor. Entitlement to produce, if we use that term, comes from the entitlement to the land rather from entitlement to the work. In fact, when people speak of work, they usually mean the work of social relationships, the work of making connections, of tending to one another. Such that, the, such that the work of the hands is evidence of the way people keep their relationships in order. A person toils in the garden for their parents or for their husband or child. Feeding the family from the fruits of one's own labor is thus an obligation that comes from relationships. A wife has a right to the husband's labor in the same way as a husband has rights to the fruits of his wife's labor because in both cases they're married. But the husband also has a right because of his relationship to his clan and the generations before him who worked the land. So in this context, one intangible right demar demarcates another. Knowledge of relationships, quite as much as memory of who occupied what places, is the basis of the claims. Only thus can someone show that it's his, and in the Western Highlands I mean his, not her, land on which the food is grown. And that goes for everything that the land grows. Now these are, I suggest, not elements in a productive model of people's relations to land, but possibly what we could call a creative model. The land that creates the people does so in parallel to everything else it yields, trees, crops, pigs, and so forth. These are analogous creations. Moreover, if the entitlement to produce comes from an initial entitlement to the land, then we should see these creations not as an extension of people's labor, but as an extension of the land itself. What the land grows belongs to it. In the same way, these creations may be, at the same time, these creations may be detached and traded and consumed or given away. In dealing with both dimensions simultaneously then, we could think of land as both an intangible resource, land owns the people, and a tangible one, people own the land. The land that stays is the enduring clan entity, the territory, the intangible and indefinite reference point to people's activities, 
and the continuity of persons who replace one another as in a clan group. The land that moves are the people who travel back and forth, incoming spouses, the food it grows, the pigs that feed off it, and all the tangible items it is possible to possess in some way. These creations are, we might say, tangible forms or expressions of its intangible creativity. In other words, there is at once a distinction and a connection between the land and its extensions, otherwise put between land as creation and its extension as creations. Land as creative, I beg your pardon, and its extension, extensions as creations. Now here for just a moment, I'm going to leave the Western Highlands because this can all be summed up uh, most neatly uh, in a story that coastal people tell. And while in the Western Highlands, the enduring connection to land is ties through men, hence the emphasis in my account, in these coastal areas it is women uh, through whom relationships to the land are stressed. And the story is from Goa Island, and it's about the origin of canoes. A group of men went to build a canoe. They hacked out a hollow from the soil and tried to make a prow board from rocks. And they worked for months, years. Now one of their sisters got tired of cooking for the unending work and went to see how far they'd got. And when the men showed her the hollow in the ground, she says, what canoe is that? You're hollowing out the soil. She points to a tree growing from the land. That's what they should be building with. So canoes are made from the fruits of the soil, trees that can be cut down and carried away, and indeed canoes are vehicles for trade, travel and exchange, and essential to the prestige men gain from their exploits overseas. A canoe, in other words, is as it were a sort of horizontal, uh, is as it were a um, uh, uh, horizontal reenactment um, of the land, the, the, the land's extensions, which grows ver vertically, uh, uh, as, as trees grow vertically, that when cut down, uh, they is redeployed, as it were, as a hor horizontal um, extension, as though the, the, the sea uh, were another kind of land. Um, the moral of the story uh, is that some things are properly harvested and consumed, that is appropriated, and some not. And there's no point in appropriating the basis of life, of reproduction, and the woman was saying, don't try to extract and cut down and, and hollow out what is creative. Enhance your reputation through taking the land's creations. The land's creations then are consumable or transferable extensions of land that itself the source of creativity is non-consumable and non-transferable. And the guarantee of both possibilities, conserving the land and exploiting its fruits, lie in the social relationships that are evidence of the way land owns people and people own land. To say that sweet potato or pigs can be regarded as an extension of the land rather than of the cultivator who sweats to plant or tend them is to say that they belong to the relationships in, with, in which that person is enmeshed. These are all particular relations and it's through particular relations that people gain their personal reputations. And this, of course, incidentally gives us rules of exclusion. No one else should take the planter's crop because the cultivation enacts the planter's and not someone else's relationships to others. Creations are at once specific extensions of named areas of land and detachable from them. So they flow across social contexts and people mobilize both values at the same time. And they may, in fact, make this visible through metaphors that cross-cut uh, these values, uh, to the confusion of the anthropologist, of course. Thus, they may use the vehicle of creations to point to the creativity of their land and use the creativity of the land to point to, their per to the personal regard that comes to them from its creations and their own accomplishments. Now, quite apart from the awkwardness of the language I'm using, I dare say there's more detail here than anyone needs. However, tacking between Eurocentric and indigenous-centered knowledges is not to mix everything up. It's not a matter of picking on different elements to put or merge together. Rather, it's the case of allowing one mode of thought to take the privileged place so that we appreciate the knowledge it yields, the perspective it brings, 
and then al allowing another mode of thinking, a privileged place. And by privileged place, I don't mean one mode being dominant over the other. I mean bringing a particular mode fully into view so that one is able to actually appreciate the detail, which is why I went into that little detail about 18th century copyright ideas and the little detail about the Garwin canoes. Without the detail, in fact, without the interconnections and interrelations in their complexity, without being specific, there'd be nothing that is particularly Eurocentric or indigenous-centered in what we learn, only vague and vacuous generalities. Where the outcome is a set of analytical tools, there are different components visible, there is the possibility of new insights to be gained out of combinations of old knowledges. And that, of course, is a platitude, but the platitude is made a little bit more interesting if we remind ourselves that this is none other than what is entailed in intellectual property rights understandings of scientific inventions. The scientists all go around telling themselves all the time that they're simply um, making new combinations of old knowledges. And where we discern the, eff the effect of different pasts coexisting in the present, we should have created a contemporary moment. And that was implied in the very question that I was asked to address, the relationship between indigenous-centered and Eurocentric knowledge. The very question I was asked to address by the people in Garoka, the contemporary didn't lie in hiding somewhere else. If this seems rather obvious, what can be taken from all this detail for the idea of the modern field? Perhaps one point is that the kinds of skills that on the face of it we may think we need for approaching the modern field, making analytical choices, holding alternatives in play, may be already embedded within what people act out. That is, um, uh, 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 seeing alternatives, uh, uh, creating an either-or uh, situation. At the same time, such people may include both those interlocutors already familiar to the anthropologist and new kinds of people with new questions about the world. In turn, the anthropologist's description and analysis may be enhanced by the conjunctions of a contemporary moment, dealing with more than one dimension at a time, say, or being simultaneous and sequential together. It was worth, after all, perhaps, keeping with those two categories, indigenous-centered and Eurocentric, clumsy as they might have seen. Perhaps we've turned them from modernist alternatives to contemporary analytics. It's not being interested in intellectual property rights that signals a new field, but in being made aware of sources of vocabulary and concepts that draw one again to look at existing realities. After all, if intellectual property rights introduces a global dimension, it's because it enables a description of a phenomenon one now realizes was already global in its import, namely the intangible value of land. Thank you very much. Okay, if, if, if there aren't any questions, um, then maybe that will give me a moment or two to put a, put a little gloss on what, I, what I've just been talking about. Um, I realized as I was going through it, um, despite my woodenness in front of the, um, uh, in front of the, the, the camera, uh, that um, I was actually, it, was, it had actually become quite a complicated text and that, it, that the text itself contained residues or contained um, elements of very different analytical vocabularies. Uh, there was, first of all, the vocabulary in which I was trying to, without in, in any sense, as it were, talk, in, in any sense trying to appear pedagogic, but trying to bring a Papua New Guinean audience along with me in understanding what intellectual property rights were about. So that there was some rather obvious passages on what copyright and patent law might be. I was also constrained by the original uh, uh, by the original question to deal with this false dichotomy between indigenous centered and Eurocentric knowledge and of course it's false because everyone everyone in this room will know that one is already, uh, in, 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 in even raising the term knowledge, one is already appropriating a particular, a particular vantage point uh, and simply to divide knowledge into two types doesn't in fact deal with all the issues that there are in 
uh, speaking of things um, uh, that exist in in uh, uh, that that exist in languages and uh, and and and, uh, and and uh, and and practices um, that that would not um, uh, uh, um, objectify or, or reify a, a concept of knowledge. Okay, so there there, there was there was spe there was uh, the the elements of the of the paper that were dealing with those two terms, which is why I referred to to the, the to the awkwardness of those terms. Uh, but at the same time, I felt I felt very constrained with this particular um, audience that I was uh, dealing with. Um, I felt it. I felt it a, a simple matter of courtesy. I mean, I, I was, after all, a, a guest that I had to deal with the way in which they presented the issues to me. Because, after all, isn't that what one does in the field anyway? You deal with the way issues are. What to me is quite a helpful um, uh, helpful product I use that term because yeah a helpful product um, to extract from a little bit of reading that I've done in intellectual uh, property um, uh, as a way of thinking about areas that one would never otherwise have dreamt of using um, that particular area uh, of law um, uh, of law Four. Um, I then realised that what made it especially complicated, and I, I'm sorry about this, is that I then pressed that paper into service for this Danish seminar, which is all about the modern field. And everybody was at the seminar was grumbling about why do we have to talk about the modern field? You know, what, why, have the, why have we been set this problem to talk about? Um, in that case, it was the particular graduate students at the seminar had very much wanted to talk about the modern field, so that's what we that's what we we had to talk about. And in the course of in the course of thinking that, and also in the course of um, uh, uh, looking at uh, Rabinow and Marcus's book on uh, aspects of the of, of, of the of the uh, uh, contemporary. Um, I thought that there was some little bit of mileage to be got from thinking of uh, the modernist ethos as always implying alternatives. That is, rather than using a, a vocabulary of progression, using uh, the vocabulary of alternation, that one is constantly making a choice, whether it's an analytical choice or choice of what road to follow, or do, do we follow business and law or custom or, and, and whatever, that these, this is a modernist ethos. But that to counterpose the notion of the contemporary, one was instead bringing into um, a coexistence um, what one might loosely call alternatives, but which were, uh, in fact, um, elements that could sort of coexist simultaneously. And finally, to get to, this, to, get to the end of this, wh what, I, what I wanted to do was, I think what I, we want, I've been doing now for too long, I suppose, uh, which is to show that um, there's no particular prerogative that belongs in, and I speak in my case, for, to Northern Europeans for being flexible or imaginative in the concepts they use or being able to think of two things at the same time or being able to regard the past and the future as alternatives or being able to regard the past and the future as sort of coexisting and so on and so forth and that these operations if, if we th think of them like that as uh, acts of intellectual agility, uh, one can actually read from the ethnographic record and one can read almost anywhere from the ethnographic record and going back to this old stuff about land tenure and ancestors and so forth, which um, uh, is an old hat really in, uh, in ethnography. Um, my intent was to make that, as it were, live again uh, in, 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 this, in this particular context. So I'm afraid, I'm really sorry, that I, I was layering, I think I was, doing, I, was doing, I was doing a lot of things at the same time, uh, and the vocabulary jumps around, jumps around all over the place. But isn't that the sign, in fact, of this issue of a contemporary moment? I mean, if, in fact, one is dealing with 
several audiences and myself as my own audience. I mean, we're all audience. I mean, it's not, that's, that's, not, that's not a distancing term, it's an inclusive term. Then the writing shouldn't be proceeding smoothly, should it? Anyway, I'll stop there. No. Uh, in fact, trying to react for both audiences. I have a question uh, for the Danish uh, audience and, and another one for the Papua New Guinea audience. Well, the first question, which is, somehow you, you have answered it, it's about uh, the idea of a modern field. And it's, I would like to know how would you compare your different contemporary moments in New Guinea? Uh, what I'm trying to, to, to say is that how your experience in the 70s compare with your experience now and to, d to define the contemporary moment, this one, as a, a, a modern feud. Uh, wouldn't be, I mean, the, the dichotomy between traditional and modern Eurocentric knowledge and indigenous knowledge, not put in terms of knowledge, but in terms of uh, uh, tradition and modernity, was not the same dichotomy that was there in the 70s. That's the question for the Danish audience. The question for um, the part of the, the, the paper which concerns more uh, intellectual uh, property rights is a sort of comparison with the Amazonian case. I mean, uh, the basic idea that labor is uh, what one of the things that defines the relationship between a person and a thing uh, in terms of ownership uh, derives from, from many authors, but from Locke, and the idea that you own your own body. So uh, the, the expense of your own work sort of attach things that are, are given in common uh, by God to yourself. So you have claims for to ownership based on labor. Um, I would say that, that uh, there is another way of thinking about this relationship which is more about you know, fabrication and engendering, uh, where the, the basic metaphor is, is, is procreation, and which also uh, gives rise to a certain vocabulary of ownership, which is certainly different because it's based on a relationship and with different peoples and not a self relation to his or herself, to his uh, own body. So that's a bit, uh, there is a, a further iteration in the case of Amazonia because um, in general creativity is, is thought as uh, something that is outside uh, the human sphere and so you, you depend on a relationship with an extra human, a non-human uh, person uh, to be creative or even to conquer something that can be th thought as cr s some sort of creativity, then you fabricate something else. But that's another uh, iteration in this, this model. Well, thank you, thank you very much for that. Um, I think that the, your, first, uh, your first question of how one might compare contemporary moments and harking back to the 1970s, or indeed, a, could even, I, can, I can even hark back to the 1960s, um, is, uh, uh, is, is an inter interesting one. It's interesting, of course, because the, the, the question would have been hardly, hardly articulated, so I need to take a view from the present, looking, looking, back, uh, uh, looking, looking back to that moment, and I think it would have been an interesting one for the, for the Danish, uh, um, uh, the Danish uh, uh, audience. Um, that was the, the moment at which if, or the time at which um, tradition and modernity uh, as a contrast was circulating in uh, development discourse or beginning to circulate uh, very widely in development discourse and uh, all the issues or, or some of the issues for anthropology uh, had, had to do with the implicit notions of um, of uh, progress and the the the, the relative, relative 
the relativity between uh, developers and people being uh, being developed. I think that was the, the sort of ethical crisis that existed in in the in, in the in the nineteen in the nineteen sixties and um, uh, and and nineteen nineteen uh, seventies. Uh, but I think behind your, your behind your question is a is a, a, a conceptual uh, issue that I must go away and think about more um, uh, more clearly. I'm not sure that I f uh, fully followed uh, the the, the uh, second question. Um, the context in, in which um, labor uh, uh, is, an, is an element in, in, in the way uh, uh, possessions and so forth are, are thought about. Um, I, I was uh, locating very sort of specifically uh, uh, in the uh, particular ar European arguments about, arguments about, uh, about uh, uh, property. And I just wanted to ask you back very briefly if you could expand again on your comments on, on Amazonia and your, what you meant by fabrication. What I mean by fabrication um, is mais perto, assim. Não sei falar em microfone. Um, let me try to explain by contrast with the by contrast with um, the let's say the 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 way you produce things through labor. Fabrication would be a process that involves some sort of transformation which is not the same way we think about producing material things in the Aristotelian way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, uh, which always involves a sort of capacity that is, uh, let's say, depends on a relationship with the extra human mm -hmm, mm -hmm. source of creativity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, okay, that, that's uh, th yes. Thank, thanks for that. Um, uh, yes, I think uh, that in fact would uh, compel me to think further about um, about what, what is what is going on in in in, in the Western Highlands, uh, where there is uh, very much um, uh, what I would call a, a reproductive notion about the way things grow. Uh, which uh, require one, for example, in, in, in horticulture, uh, in extracting from the soil things that have been grown for as long as they're in the soil, they grow invisibly. At the point of extraction, they stop growing, which is what extraction does. Um, but at that point, they're available for consumption, exchange, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and so forth. And those crops won't grow unless the growers' relation, relationships are various. I mean, there are various particular relationships that have to be in place and properly, uh, properly um, attended to, uh, in order for that to in order for that to take place. And it would, be, in fact, be an extremely interesting exercise to take some of the uh, 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 Amazonian uh, vocabularies to do on transformations of bodies and so forth and see what could be done in 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 the Melanesian yeah. context with with the, the the very particular obsession they have um, less with form um, but what I call growth that is demonstration of increase and it's this notion of increase that seems to obsess the horticulturists of this region that I think is 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 is, is not is not found in the Amazonian context, but it would be very interesting to think about the vocabulary of transformation in that situation. And I've, I've never, knew, I've never really known what increase is or what growth is, and that remains a question I need to work on. No estudo da companhia Schlumberger sobre a propriedade intelectual do conhecimento para em prospecção de petróleo, né, Jeffrey Balker diz que tudo que se precisa para ir a julgamento é uma história respeitável, suficientemente respeitável. E me ocorreu perguntar a você sobre o papel...
é, ativista da antropologia, no sentido de, da capacidade que ela tem de prover histórias respeitáveis para conhecimentos é, é, não eurocêntricos. Uh, thank you. I, I, I'm not quite sure of the, I'm not quite sure of the context from uh, uh, from which you're coming and, and to which you referred. So my, my answer may be a bit off. Um, a bit, a bit off-key. Um, there's always uh, the, a, a, a possibility for anthropological uh, activism insofar as um, uh, pol policy makers, legislators, or the, the courts um, Wish to enhance, wish to enhance uh, the knowledge that they have at their at their disposal, since um, anthropologists are dealers in knowledge, uh, and uh, that, that that the conclusion that the Australian um, judge came to, that I quoted at, at, at one point, uh, was derived from um, Australian uh, anthropological discussion and debate, and I should say a considerable argument uh, with it within Australia. Um, Uh, on issues of issues of land. Uh, in fact, the Australian case is quite interesting because there is enormous dispute about the uh, uh, the fact that in dealing with land, one is dealing with uh, uh, anthropological models that aren't themselves settled, so that there are, I mean, from one point of view, interesting, but from another point of view, uh, very difficult controversies that are, arise in any attempt to apply anthropological knowledge or turn anthropologists into activists um, as though at that point they ceased to engage with their own debates with their colleagues. And in fact one of the difficulties in the Australian situation was that um, uh, anthropologists were uh, continuing their debates with their colleagues at the same time as uh, trying to be, uh, in, in some cases, informants and expert witnesses and, uh, and so forth uh, uh, for, for the courts. Um, uh, one, one can look at it from many points of view. From some points of view, it could, it, it could have been no other way. And to pretend that there weren't in, internal conflicts would have been, would have been ridiculous. Uh, from other points of view, Uh, one might have looked for some kind of uh, uh, consensus that would actually create a category that you could have referred to um, as uh, as anthropological knowledge in in this in this sense. Um, I I suspect that um, uh, one could only um, comment on your question about about what role anthropologists have in. Uh, 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 pr producing uh, information that is of use in, uh, as, as, you, uh, as you put it, sufficiently uh, uh, respectable. Um, on a on a case by case basis, um, simply because, uh, to be a bit contemporary about it, uh, one would need to see those anthropologists in relation to all kinds of other people who might have interests in expounding knowledge of particular, uh, of, of particular kinds. Uh, certainly in the Papua New Guinean uh, 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 context, um, uh, being an anthropologist carries a credibility, a credibility of a kind, but if the anthropologist is any good, Uh, the anthropologist will want to know what um, lawyers and activists uh, from Papua New Guinea themselves are thinking about and dealing with, and may in that context need to make all kinds of uh, compromises in the way that they uh, themselves uh, uh, want want to present want to present their knowledge. So that one has to be um, alert to the contemporary political and academic. Uh, academic, uh, situation. Eu, eu, na verdade, eu não queria é, fazer uma pergunta, mas é, talvez fazer uma, é, algumas, muito poucas observações sobre a palestra é, da, da Mary. É, 
é, porque me parece que ela deu uma, uma lição muito importante de o que, que significa exatamente fazer uma antropologia, é, a famosa ideia de antropologia reversa. O que, que ela significa na prática? É, porque era um conceito que, quando foi proposto originalmente é, pelo Wagner, era um conceito ainda um, um pouco indeterminado. E boa parte do trabalho recente do, dos tem sido o de é, da carne esse conceito, de dar, da determinação esse conceito. E uma coisa que eu acredito ter percebido na, no, no exemplo que a Mary nos apresentou hoje, foi de que a antropologia reversa não é uma alternativa à antropologia, mas uma alternativa dentro da antropologia, é um momento da antropologia, e que não é um momento simples, mas é um momento de uma oscilação constante, é como manter um estado de oscilação constante entre movimentos internos à, 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 é, que é, fazem alternar os pontos de vista, é, 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 esses pontos de vista que os intelectuais é, melaneses chamavam de eurocêntricos e, e, e indígenas é, e, e indígenas é, Essa ideia de que se trata de uma oscilação perpétua e não de uma alternativa, de uma escolha que é preciso ser feita, mas ao contrário, escolher não escolher, escolher é, manter essas duas perspectivas em tensão constante, me parece ser a lição que é, ela nos trouxe, de que é, a possibilidade de que essas perspectivas se é, é, alternem, como figura e fundo, foi a metáfora que ela usou, e que essa alternância é propriamente infinita, propriamente interminável. Isso me pareceu ser um ponto importante da, da, da exposição dela. O segundo ponto importante foi ela mostrar como, ter mostrado como... É, é, o, o, bom, primeiro, há um deslocamento, que a, a palestra dela registra, mas... É, e que, é, há um deslocamento que é, a gente pode perceber na história um pouco recente do conceito de conhecimento, que é um conceito que voltou a se tornar é, estratégico dentro da antropologia como objeto, não apenas como instrumento é que nós aprendemos, na década de 70, é, a explorar todas as possibilidades da relação entre conhecimento e poder, isto é, conhecimento e política. Né? Conhecimento é poder, poder e conhecimento. Na década de 80 e 90, nós aprendemos a relação entre conhecimento e propriedade, isto é, entre conhecimento e economia. Né? Antes nós tínhamos uma política do conhecimento e passamos a perceber agora uma economia do conhecimento. É, passamos a, entender, é, a ver no horizonte surgir a ideia de uma economia do conhecimento. E a Mary mostrou também, na palestra de hoje, como existe também uma religião do conhecimento, é, na medida em que ela conseguiu mostrar como é, é, a noção de conhecimento é indissociável de noções que possuem uma raiz é, propriamente teológica no pensamento antropológico, no pensamento ocidental, como conceito de criação e de criatividade, e como é, é necessário, como me parece que esse é um, talvez tenha sido a a lição mais iluminadora da, da, da palestra dela, é de que maneira, ao colocar os melaneses em cena, né, é, isso nos obriga a dissociar componentes conceituais que nós vimos como indissociáveis, como, por exemplo, a relação entre criatividade e produção e produtividade, ou entre criação e produção, né, que, classicamente, no Ocidente, se eu, não me, se eu me perdoo a simplificação brutal, é, essas duas noções sempre se espelharam uma na outra, de alguma forma. O modelo da, da produção era a criação divina, o modelo da criação era a produção é, fabricante, é, do oleiro, do, do fabricante de potes, do, do artesão, como no modelo de, 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 de Deus da criação é, do primeiro homem. A necessidade de separar a criação e produção, criatividade e produtividade, me parece que é algo que é, é, é o desafio que, o, a tradução dos conceitos milaneses nos coloca como repensar, na verdade, como dissociar os componentes, é, digamos, subconceituais dos nossos conceitos e recombiná-los de maneiras é, é, inesperadas e perceber que eles é, aparecem em outros lugares é, recombinados é, dessas maneiras. E, nesse sentido, eu acho que a, 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 a mesma coisa se dá em relação à intangibilidade e tangibilidade e essa, é, digamos, é, decisão propriamente, ou essa é, alternativa propriamente revolucionária que consiste em, em, em repensar o conceito de terra a partir da noção de intangibilidade. 
que é como o Meredith chamou atenção, até a própria imagem mesmo do real, ou do tangível, da propriedade real, no sentido etimológico do termo. E, entretanto, é, o que os melaneses nos ensinam, nos obrigam a pensar, é a terra como modelo a relação com a terra como modelo mesmo do, é, do intangível. E, portanto, de como é a própria ideia de conhecimento que se torna subitamente deslocada do lugar que ela ocupava. É, me parece que essas foram as, as, as foi o que eu é, digamos aprendi dessa dessa é, palestra da Mary e se fosse fazer alguma pergunta seria pedir que ela voltasse um pouco sobre é, como repensar essa dissociação é, de maneira mais abstrata digamos assim é, saindo por um momento do concreto e talvez voltando ao que ela chamou de generalidades vazias é, voltar ao como, como como pensar um conceito de criatividade que não tenha por trás a sombra do produtivismo né? ou um conceito de increase que não tenha a sombra do crescimento econômico do crescimentismo que não, não nos, nos aproxime da do, do crescimento a qualquer preço que nós brasileiros conhecemos bem de perto é, como ideologia é, e como é, podemos pensar um conceito de produção por reciprocamente, que não esteja dominado por uma ideia é, é, teológica de criação como, como ato é, de soberania absoluta do sujeito sobre o mundo. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, after those kind words, I'm not sure it's very becoming of me to respond at all, but thank, thank, you, thank you indeed. Um, Uh, I think you've put your finger, of course, on something very interesting, uh, which is that although I was using creations and creativity to get me out of the productivist, uh, to get me out of a productivist vocabulary, crea creation and creativity themselves are, of course, absolutely embedded in uh, the same uh, Eurocentric mix from which production and productivity and so forth uh, uh, come. Um, it is, in fact, no escape. Um, all it did was um, allow me to um, find a way of um, uh, in introducing some of the intellectual property rights, uh, the property rights vocabulary. Um, and I was also following certain ideas of James Leach and so forth, who, who, who uses the word creativity. Uh, but I think one could have written a parallel paper in which the, the notion of creativity itself was a critique. And of course, it's an important one because a, a, a lot of a, a driver of um, a lot of the contemporary discourse on uh, innovation um, and indeed a, a driver of a lot of um, uh, reforms in uh, academic and uh, university life, at least um, over there, Uh, in uh, in Europe uh, rest on the notion of the creative person who can uh, produce out of what is around them uh, a new environment, new goals, new incentives, and so forth. And this is, uh, and while it's very hard not to be attracted to the notion of creativity because it touches on all of us because we're all um, thinkers and writers and doers and would like to think that we have that there are um, uh, that, that there are effects that we show uh, for our actions nevertheless it's become it's become an, an ideological issue just as production and productivity was uh, what I what 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 you catch me out on um, is um, the theological antecedents of the notions of creation and creativity Uh, I thought I was explicitly putting those aside by turning to dry old law where one didn't have to deal with them, but I think you're quite right um, that, of course, the antecedents are there in, in, uh, uh, in uh, theology. Um, all, I can, all I can say at, at this moment is um, that actually I need to go in the reverse direction, if I may say, that is not to more generalities, but I think, but to more particulars. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things that, um, and since, since I'm retired, I can, I, you know, I can say what I like, you know. <laughs> 
And one of, the, one of the things that I want to do eventually in the course of my retirement, as I've already been discussing with a colleague, um, is, uh, uh, is go back to some issues in the gender of the gift that deal precisely with this, a this area of growth and transformation and so forth, uh, and really try to be a bit more sophisticated about my um, uh, initial descriptions from the ethnography novels. I need, need to go back into the detail, really, before I can come out again into, uh, uh, into, th into thinking about, uh, into th into thinking about uh, generalities. But I take your general point about creation and creativity. They're, they're, they're no good either. But that's how we proceed. And, 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 and um, if I may go back again to m my taking seriously this very awkward question, the one, thing, the one thing it was important not to do was to say, this is an awkward question. It was a question that, n that needed to be dealt with. Uh, and uh, um, one just substitutes other awkwardnesses, of course, but in that constant process of substitution.